welcome to the Fleet Geeks podcast. We're here to help develop fleet and transport professionals. Do you want to progress and develop your skills and knowledge? We promise to bring lively conversation and debate around interesting issues and keep you bang up to date with changes in our awesome industry. The Fleet Geeks are a community of professionals and if you enjoy the podcast, why not join the discussion for free in the Fleet Geek community over on Facebook. Red light is rolling. Uh, What are we talking about today, chaps? Well, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, just, just, I think, just a roll around on the industry standards or standards that we can, quality marks, standard marks that we come across in the industry. Um, And I must admit, one of them is a little bit of a mystery to me. So uh, we're going to be talking about FOARS, Freight Operator Recognition Scheme. Uh, it weren't recognition. Almost, yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah. Fleet, oh, no, yeah. almost. Fleet operator. Freight. Sorry, mate. Freight. What did I say? Freight. freight. Did I say freight? Oh, yeah, God. too busy being in the yeah. FTA, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> fleet operator recognition. Oh, ironically, I used to call the FTA. The yeah, fleet, <laughs> fleet you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Earned recognition and clocks. Ooh, construction. Oh, you can tell me that one. I don't know what that means. Oh, to be well, fair. Yeah, we'll summarise clocks. It's very similar to four silver. Well, there we go. Let's <laughs> dealt with clocks. So, clocks is to do with the... Uh, if I'm, I'm right in thinking this, it's to do with the construction industry. And yes, if you want yeah. to be, if I want to go and build a uh, tower block in London, say, like, boy, you know, when he's clocks, you know, not necessarily. If I want to go and build a tower block, um, then I need to be as the builder, as the as the developer, I need to be clocks compliant, don't I? So what does that mean with my uh, freight operators that will be bringing my raw materials and taking my waste away? Yeah, so construction, logistics, and community safety clocks. Community safety, yeah. So do, you, do you know what? I, think I'm, I did know you once I heard it referred to as cycle safety as well. No, I think there community would be elements of cycle, cycle safety yeah. in there, I would imagine. I've yeah. never had a lot to do with clocks, even though I can think of structure as big as force. Yeah. Um, so we, we they're, they're both TFL schemes, though, aren't yeah. they? They were originally they are, TFL yeah, schemes. Yeah. We, we talk about. Clocks and fours being London centric, but that they, they they were originally, yeah. I think. But uh, because they've seen as an industry standard, I know uh, you know particularly with uh, with fours and clocks that it's not just about London, is it anymore? It's, I, it's, I, it's I didn't even like, realise though. Here's something for you. I never realised for years. I've been looking at that four symbol, thinking it was a wheel, and I didn't know what the squiggle was through it. I just thought it was like a design it's feature. Thames. It's the Thames. It's Thames, is it really? Like, it's the Thames. Oh, that's geek. That's geek. Right. To a different I don't know. Did you not? No, there that you go. See, to a different I can't. Level. I can't remember who told me that. I reckon wow. that might have been Keith Gray. Actually, that I think that sounds, might have been on the Keith Gray that podcast. Sounds like a Keith thing that does. Even yeah. Though, even though that I think it might have been, and I apologise if it was someone else, yeah. and I'm shouting out the wrong person. But I think yeah. that was a Keith Gray one. Like Listen Keith to the Half Dozen Things podcast for that one. Um, yeah, good one, Keith Gray. He's an interesting guy. Yeah, I think they're, they're great schemes to improve road safety. Anything that improves road safety is a good idea. Absolutely. And uh, if, if they do, if they, that's their aim. If they do do that, um, that's, that's kind of a bonus. Also, environment as well. Obviously, mm. Yeah, I don't know the clock standards much, obviously, or anything about the clock standards, to be perfectly honest. But obviously, with fours, environmental is, a, is quite important. Yeah, particularly for yeah. silver. Four yeah. silver really starts to look at the but environmental the impact, does, doesn't it? I think four silver clocks do align in certain areas. Is, yeah. Is quite yeah, yeah, got you. Yeah. yeah, so for I think I think the thing with I think with the fours has had a challenging history. I would I would argue, it's, and I'm always a little yeah. bit skeptical about uh, about it. We largely I when when we first started the the flagship business, I um, I wasn't interested in doing fours. I didn't want to know until one client uh, decided that we were the the you know we were the uh, supporting company for them and they wanted us to help them with fours and uh, I actually remember pre or taking that client on and actually going and visiting Jamie in his old job to get a bit of a lowdown around fours yeah Yeah. Um, so uh, it was it was one of those and I, I I how I reconciled it in my head because I saw fours largely as uh, this this sort of money making type thing that had kind of gone awry. It started with the best of intentions, and then it had kind of gone yeah. awry. And that was my perspective of it, Absolutely. because I'd seen I'd seen when in my time with the vehicle manufacturer that I worked for, and I shan't name him because it's not fair, but. Um, 
with the vehicle manufacturer I was working for, they uh, I saw these operators, particularly out in the Barden area that I, you know I took on a sales role around there for a little while, and we were having to spec vehicles, and you know the the operators were having to put four grand's worth of extra kit on just to meet the requirement, and I would say to them, well, why are you having this done? And they were like, well, we have to have it. And I was like, why do you have to have it? And they go, because we wouldn't be able to get on site without it. And I'm like, right, okay. Does it make any impact on your business? No, not really. I was like, do you pay any attention to it? No, not really. Uh, What's the audit like? Nothing really, it just is what it is. It's just a cost, it's just cost exercise. Do you get paid any extra for having it? No. And all, you know, all of the things that led to my perspective on it was like, pretty negative to the tape. yeah yeah what what benefit is this having if people aren't really paying attention but then then we took this operator on and i started to learn a lot more about it and and what have you and um you know they were they were going for silver and i started to learn a bit more about the silver silver system and that kind of thing and i think i think it's like anything they were going to get paid more for having put more per load for having silver than bronze and i was like right i can reconcile this in my head i'm helping my operator be more profitable that's okay. That's what we do, right? We help them be safer. We help them be more profitable so I can deal with this. So I kind of reconciled it that way. And ever since then, we've helped many customers now uh, get bronze and then go on to silver as well. And um, what I found is that my challenges around it are first, and I think, you know, they're largely dealing with it, but the, the standard from a auditing point of view has been fairly in you know intermittent or fairly different in the way that people audit it um largely speaking i think the audits aren't rigorous enough Uh, i don't think they test the systems i think you can pretty much put the documentation in place and tick through because you're trying to do it all within a day and there's so much to do if you manage that as an iso standard uh you know it'd be several day audit but um but yeah so i think those are sort of my real challenges but i think if you're committed to it and you you do it and you're going to make profit from it then then it's a positive thing because i think it can help improve your business but on the on the pl- other side you know you hear shock horror stories of the traffic commissioner taking away you know revoking licenses for yeah. people who have just passed their fours bronze the yeah. week before yeah. you know so i think they take a fairly dim view on it yeah. sometimes no, that doesn't help with, with that, does it? no, no. The, the need for it as well no it's not to, i think that that uh, you know i think it was nick dent and the traffic commissioner who uh, Westminster traffic man who 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 made that statement and said you know kind of like it's not fit for purpose. He did actually come out on record as saying that uh, Fours is not fit for purpose because people were people were, were were misaligning it with the requirements of the operators' licensing and uh, you know as you say like people were getting brought uh, Fours bronze and then losing their operators' license a, a few weeks later and looking flabbergasted. Because, well, I know, a minute, I've just been fours accredited. Yeah. Well, What's going on? An operator we worked with asked me the other week, if I, if, if I go and get fours, will I get pulled over less? I went, no. No, no, that's so bad. I bother that. <laughs> okay. So some, somebody in, in, you know, in Transport for London, TFL, somebody in the, you know, in the early stages of this really did a good job of the marketing because people, if you ask, you know, I'm not, such, I'm not sure everybody in the country would be interested, but if you ask in our industry, um, maybe those that are not involved with, with the transport management side of things, what's FORS? Most people will have heard of FORS, yeah. and it, oh, that's something you need if you go to London. Yeah, I, it, sure. it, it, I think I think FORS success was a, it was a magic mix, and I wasn't about when it first started, or, or wasn't paying attention to it, I suppose, because we weren't in London. But marketing's been brilliant. And then the other has been lazy safety management, i.e., well, we can meet all of our safety requirements for operating on this site by saying that all transport yeah, operators exactly have got to have fours. Yeah. Exactly what it is. Lazy safety management yeah. because it, it gives a badge and safety people go, Ooh, that's ah, good. Yeah. there you go. I yeah. haven't got to ask. I haven't got to ask because someone's audited them. I know they've got eight risk assessments. I know they've got, yeah, yeah. you know, this policy and that procedure because otherwise they wouldn't have it for fours bronze. So, that I think I think that has been a massive it was literally you know for for site managers for health and safety bods um, uh, you know it it really hit a a target market for them to go yeah it meets a standard they meet a standard I don't have to do my due diligence happy days yeah I still meet I still meet transport managers today who will say to me oh you need force to go into London no you don't no you just need to be compliant with the safe London Norris scheme yeah. And that's what that's where Fours was born from. 
So 2003, the Safer London Lorry Scheme required you to meet certain standards before your vehicle would be allowed into the 17 boroughs of, uh, of London. Uh, and, and, and so Fours was born out of that requirement. But as long as you're compliant with the Safer London Lorry Scheme, you can go into London with anything. You know, it's not. Mm-hmm. Well, so, now we've got the DBS, obviously. DB, now we have some. Yeah, so now we have the DBS, Direct Vision Standards. That's another podcast for another day, I'm guessing. Uh, we also have uh, the ULEZs and the LEZs. So there's lots of things you need to consider. But for, in terms of the Safer London Lorry Scheme, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have. Uh, force to comply with that. Oh, you can absolutely. comply with that without force. Have we, have we given force enough of a kick in yet? What I will say with force, <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if you're you're defend, more you'll get out of it. Yeah. If you actually do it. I, I, I agree. It so the not, principle, the principle's yeah, the really good about it. Absolutely. So the touch. principle's very laudable and I'm now going to defend force. So, mm-hmm. uh, so force, I think, is a good thing. Um, as we've said there, the principle is a, is a great thing. Uh, anybody who's done the Force Practitioners Program, that's an invaluable piece of training. Um, uh, and actually for London operators, it's free, isn't it? So, you know, for, for external London operators, it's, it's a, there's a cost to it. But uh, you, can, you can gain a lot from that. It's very interesting. It's, it's in, in a lot of cases, it's reasonably well delivered. Um, two things that come out of Force for me. One of them is the eyesight testing. Now, I know people are just paying lip service to this and they won't really do it. But there is nothing else in legislation where we, we are required to test for eyesight, you know, it's, it's a requirement for drivers to obviously maintain the vision standards. But I think, so that one is one thing for me. And also the accident investigation element of FOURS. Uh, there's too many operators simply put chalk off accidents as being just or one of those things or something, you know, an occupational hazard, something we have to go through. Hi, it's Pete from Flagship Partners. We're really proud to sponsor the Fleet Geeks podcast. Flagship Partners offer a range of consultancy and training services to ensure that our customers remain compliant and have the best possible knowledge to be able to fulfil their work. If you're interested in support with any of our safety, HR or compliance services or you want to train to be a transport manager or need driver CPC training, give us a call today. Um, To get where we want to be, but FORS requires you to investigate accidents quite thoroughly. Uh, and I think every operator could learn from that. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stick. I'm going to stand in the corner for fours and no, and and and, and, and I totally agree. I think it's also brought apparently brought about ongoing CPD requirements yeah. as well. Like I think toolbox talks, it, it sort of opened the door for that. So that there is that you know we've given it a slate in, but actually yeah. there is a lot of positives that have come out of it. Ongoing CPD. Yeah. I think that the principle of suds. The safe urban driving yeah. course, where um, you know you, it, we go back to the cultural conversation we we're having before, like let's get HGV drivers out of their trucks and out on bikes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a that's a really vital bit of training to be. Oh, and people will say, "Oh, a cyclist should do the same." And do you know what? I've been involved in those programs um, where cyclists have been invited into the cab of a vehicle HGV, and I will say that nine, almost ten out of ten cyclists come will step down from that cab and say, I didn't understand, I didn't realise. So it does happen. They are positive things. It's not yeah. every cyclist that's... Yeah, and anything that increases empathy between road users is yeah. a great idea, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Okay, so we'll move on to earned recognition. Yeah. So just to set the scene for that, we're, we're in the process of going for our earned recognition approval at uh, Flagship Partners. We get an ISO 9001, which we'll talk about ISO in a little bit, um, but we need to get ISO 9001 to become approved auditors for uh, earned recognition. What I would say is if you're looking to get earned recognition, we can help you reach that standard because uh, that's kind of what we do. We help people get ready for fours, we help introduce the standards, and we can certainly help people introduce earned recognition at the moment as well. So if it's something you're thinking about, please do check it out. And I'd also say before I draw Jamie and Mike in, there's a really good podcast podcast on a half dozen things where I got to interview Phil Breen who heads up uh, the DVSA earned recognition scheme on behalf of the DVSA he's a very experienced former traffic examiner he headed up the bus department I think for a long time Um, and he's an all-round personable decent decent chap Um, so I do recommend having a listen and I think that will give you some more insight into earned recognition but uh, nonetheless uh, yeah what's our vibe on earned recognition what do we think? Massively positive, I think. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. I think it's been quite a slow uptake. It has been. I think I think there's been a, an element of a lack of trust with, yeah. uh, you know, or an uncertainty with how the DVSA would manage the data that they were provided. 
Absolutely, you know, I, I, you hear operators talk all the time about, that means I've got to give them my passwords to all my, to my computer systems and, you know, they're going to be, I'm going to be making a cheese sandwich in my kitchen one day and there's going to be a DVSA officer stood over my shoulder watching what I'm going to be doing. That's not the case at all, is it? I mean, it is, you know, let's be realistic about it. That's not what's required from, from earth recognition, is it? No, absolutely not. And, and Phil sort of disp- dispels those myths. Essentially, uh, that th- there's a reporting system that you that you report back to the DVSA. I think, I think, interestingly, what happens often and for, DVSA are going to get loads of credit because the earned recognition scheme is really rather good. It, from what I can tell, it's really rather good and it aligns with the reg the regulatory requirements oh, of running an operator's crazy. license, which yeah. is the key thing. You get in this DVSA stamp of approval, and um, you know it, it, it. They've got the regulatory back in. Um, and, but what they've also done is they've been able to see the mistakes that Ford's made and they've been able to go second. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, that helps. Never and that does, yeah. that does always help, doesn't it? You know, so again, just a little bit of a stick up for Ford's there because DVSA, I've seen, they've seen kind of the things that have gone wrong and the commercial element of what Ford's is and earned recognition isn't, a, you know, this isn't a commercial thing. Whilst it gives commercial advantage to the operators who are earned recognition because, again... A lot of people, when it comes to picking subcontractors, can be a little bit lazy, and badge and badges help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, badges help. If you've got a DVSA and recognition badge, that demonstrates straight away that you meet this requirement. People don't even need to understand what it is, but they know it's good. It sounds good, doesn't it? DVSA and recognition. recognition. It does sound good. Does yeah, it does sound good. But in reality, it is backed up by. My understanding, and I spent a bit of time with Lisa at Logico because we both sit on the transport committee for the BAA, and um, Lisa's been doing earned recognition for a, for a period of time. And I speak to, her, and the the audit is just so rigorous that it's like it's okay that you say that this is your policy or this is your procedure, but it's actually tested. You have to evidence it, um, and I think that's a good a good process for any audit. And it very much similar. Absolutely. It's almost an ISO, an ISO for vehicle operations. Um, which uh, which I think is really interesting. Really, I, I think I think it's going to be the standard moving forward. It I has think. to be. Doesn't yeah, it? it has to be. Surely, the way the world's going as well, more electronic data and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's an, it is natural progression, isn't it, to go that way? Yeah. The DSA to get your get the information without having to turn up at your premises, etc. Mm. You know, I know you only send information when you get it wrong, don't you? Generally, a lot of recognition, so it's not like that. They're constantly spying on what you're doing. It's uh, like I said, it's part of the myth of it. All. But yeah, and not that operators should be fearful of getting stopped yeah. by DVSA. However, go back to that uh, what you said there about the operator saying, "If I have fours, will I will my vehicles be stopped less regularly?" The answer to that is no. If my if I have earned recognition, will my vehicles be stopped less regularly? They, are, they won't. You know, it won't. So you, you're, yes. You've gone out of that. You know, uh, probably OCRS is the talk for another day, but you've gone out of that operator compliance risk score. You've, you've gone out of that, you're a recognised operator, you sit on a, on the top table. you got the blue, you got the yeah. blue, you're beyond the green, yes. the blue beyond the green. So yeah, it's. Um, I think I think that's an interesting one. Whilst we're talking about standards, I, I wanted to just wade in on the ISO standards as well. Uh, we've recently helped uh, one of our one of our clients, or several of our clients actually, um, because we've had, uh, had a local skip company who we've helped initially qualify, uh, which was a, a big deal for us, uh, for their 9001. So 9001 is the quality management standard. Uh, 14,001 is the environmental standard and 45,001 is the health and safety standard. Now, what we do with operators who want to have multiple standards in that way, we build what's called an integrated management system. So we take those uh, we take those standards and we build an integrated management system that will include a manual, it will include all of the risk assessments, policies and procedures and also things around like... Um, uh, making sure that version controls in place of documentation and those kinds of things, and you know they're they're really good standards to have. In in fact, the DVSA earned recognition for for you to be an auditor for it, you have to have ISO nine thousand and one yeah. in your business. Um, so that demonstrates the standing that DVSA have in the ISO system as well. Uh, so the 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 quality management system and JALP to nine thousand and one accredited as well. Uh, I think uh, Mike has had some experience of working with an, a company who have uh, got nine thousand and one accreditation. So mm. interested to hear what your experience may be, um, but. Uh, you know the, the the client we've worked with they they operate in the removal sector 
They've got the three ISO standards and then a range of British standards around warehousing, storage, um, even down to a, uh, we just signed them up for 22301 and it's business continuity plan. Oh, wow. yeah. So that, that gives Absolutely. people real credibility around the fact that they won't have any interruption to business, even if something catastrophic happens. So if you're looking for public sector contracts and those kinds Definitely. of things with the NHS and, and what have you, that's a really, really valuable one yeah. because um, they're starting to write it into tenders. You know, you have to have a business continuity plan. They don't want to deal. It's one of those tricky things. Small business do struggle because big big operators want to deal with big operators they want to deal with the big companies because it gives them continuity uh, so yeah what what say what say you guys about ISO uh, ISO 9001 yeah I've I've, um, it, it, I've been involved in uh, implementation of about many years ago uh, the, uh, the the original when it, when it was changed over from the BSI standard what was that 15 pounds or something I can't remember, BSI, uh, changed over the ISO uh, standard many, many moons ago, and I was involved in that implementation at that time. And, I, my, you know, it's, it's, it's it, you, I think we have to go into uh, ISO with, with understanding what it is that we're trying to do, particularly if we've got processes, if we've got, if we're a process-driven organisation, and ISO helps us line those up. Uh, so that we've got a, a system from which we can check that those processes are, 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 are successfully operating all the way down the line. It helps us identify weaknesses in those areas. So I think if we approach ISO as a, as a tick box, ex box exercise, we're not going to get again, nothing from it apart from our ISO accreditation. But if we look at it as an opportunity to improve our business, then, then and, and, and it's certainly not a, a silver bullet, so you've got to look in other areas as well, like, you know, the cultural and, you know, uh, but it's it certainly helps us build that framework by which we can hang everything else off. So um, on the other side of that coin, I have seen organisations that have become too process driven and therefore they take their eye off the ball with other stuff and it just becomes about the process. Um, I, was in, I was exposed Believe it or not, in a local authority to, uh, and you wouldn't think a local authority would go down this avenue, but I was exposed in a local authority to another way of thinking, uh, which is a kind of um, the, the nemesis of, of, of ISO, which is systems thinking. Um, so I've had experience in both, with both accounts. But you know, generally for me, ISO is definitely a good thing, particularly if you're process driven, if your operation is process driven. Yeah, definitely. And it, it makes sure everyone knows what's expected as yeah. well, doesn't it? If you, and it, like I say, don't do it as a tick box exercise. Same with fours, yeah. ISO standards. Buy into it. Yeah. If you buy into it, do do what's required rather than just think, oh, we've got an audit in a month's time, let's make sure this is all up to date. If you actually buy into it, do it properly, you do get a lot out of them, definitely. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure auditors are trained to look for yeah, they must be, definitely. tick boxes where they can see that the tick is by the same person. Yeah. Literally done, as you say, like... A, Oh, we've got an ISO audit next week. Let's make sure all the ticks. But it looks like it's just not genuine, not a genuine thing, doesn't it? It, it stands out. Yeah. I think that's what we ensure when we go to these businesses. We set them up for to operate that way, don't we? Like you said, with the manuals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and the processes in place. So it becomes it. It becomes ingrained in what it they does, do. Yeah. It becomes a part yeah. of the culture and ingrains that into them, rather than just a, a, a quick hurried tick box for for the auditor next week. Absolutely. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed today's, uh, today's episode. And uh, if you have, please do share it and listen in. Um, I do want to just mention, whilst I've got people listening, uh, we have the Fleet Geeks Peer-to-Peer -peer Mentoring Group, which is a new offer for Fleet Geeks just like you. Uh, and it will help you to develop your skills, uh, build your network and uh, help you increase the opportunities that you have for yourself and for those around you through uh, a support network where you're able to help with get help with challenges and help others with their challenges as well. It's a fantastic opportunity, so please do get in touch to find out more about that. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please share with your friends and colleagues too. Join us for free on Facebook with the Fleet Geeks community for transport and fleet managers. Fleet Geeks offers ongoing professional development, networking and mentoring too. So get in touch with me, Pete Rushmer, on any social media platform to find out more.